The limited partner shares in the potentially outsized returns of a well-planned and executed investment, but as a passive investor with no day-to-day -day operating requirements and whose liability is limited to the extent of their share of ownership. The limited partner has the maximum leverage on their most precious asset, their time. Now they say you're the average of the people you surround yourself with. Are you looking to elevate your network? Connect with individuals that bring your average up? This is more than just a podcast. It's a community to learn, to participate, and to connect. There is no other community out there like this specifically for limited partners. So subscribe to the podcast, and most importantly, join the community at thelimitedpartner.com. Welcome. I'm your host, Jake Wiley. All right, welcome again. I am your host, Jake Wiley. This week, I'm joined by Logan Freeman. So Logan is a co-founder of FTW Investments. Logan, welcome to the show. Jake, thanks for having me. I'm energized, thriving, and focused today. I'm ready to rock and roll. Awesome. Well, this is going to be a, a good conversation. All of our conversations are. I apologize. Most of you guys haven't been a part of the other ones we've had. But um, I guess to start it off, Logan, for, for my listeners out there that don't know you, if you wouldn't mind, give us a little bit of background on you know who you are, where you started, and how you kind of ended up at FTW. Absolutely. So... You know, Jefferson City, Missouri is the capital of Missouri. Not a lot of people know that. And that's where I grew up. And I always liken the uh, Jefferson City kind of mindset to Carol Dweck's book. She delineates between the fixed and uh, the growth mindset. And, you know, it's really about the fixed mindset, in Jefferson City. Nothing wrong with that. But I always had this inclination that there was something more and something a little bit uh, deeper that I might be able to tap into. And I found that when I went to college and started visiting uh, larger cities, either playing football in them, I was a collegiate athlete, or visiting Kansas City since it was so close. And but what was really important for me was I, I got to spend time around some folks that uh, just thought a little bit differently. It kind of planted a seed for me. So growing up, I was always an athlete. You know, I identified as an athlete. Got a collegiate uh, scholarship to play football. I excelled there and had the opportunity to, you know, play in the NFL very briefly with the Oakland Raiders. And being a Kansas City guy, that was uh, a little bit tough for me. But uh, I ended up getting cut from the NFL. And when I got cut, I just kind of decided that it was time for me to start the next chapter of my life. And so I went back to school against my agent's wishes, and you know, got my master's degree. I finished up my master's degree in this six-month period of time. When I was cut to when uh, I graduated with my master's degree, big changes happened. I lost 120 pounds. At the NFL Combine, I was 335 pounds. I dropped down to 219 pounds. But the biggest change happened, which what I call or I stole from, I think, Zig Ziglar, which was I turned my car to the classroom on wheels. So no longer having a scholarship, I needed to get a job to pay for uh, living expenses and tuition. So I would drive an hour to Sweet Springs, Missouri, every single day and uh, make 265 cold calls and get told no, typically 264 times per day, which was great. Uh, it was great for me from, from a learning experience. And then I would drive back to Warrensburg and go to school from four to nine every single night. And I spent 12 hours in uh, the library on Saturdays just getting caught back up. But what that taught me that period of time was to the ability to think differently. And this is when I really started to listen to a podcast. So, uh, you know, you think about Lewis Howes and John Lee Dumas. I mean, this is, uh, we're talking 2014, 2015, so a while ago. And I uh, started listening to Brian Tracy and Zig Ziglar and Jim Rohn. And I just uh, really started to understand there was a different way to think about life and about business and about personal and professional growth. And so that really helped that seed kind of blossom into a flower. And so uh, when I was finishing up my, my schooling, uh, my father, he's a full Native American, uh, 6'3", 250 pounds, you know, hit a basketball or hit a golf ball, 300 yards, dunk a basketball and came up to, to Warrensburg to help me move out of my apartment. And uh, he couldn't walk up the stairs. So I knew something was wrong. My dad had always struggled with his addiction to drugs and alcohol. And unfortunately, six weeks after I graduated, my dad passed away with complications from his liver cirrhosis. And so think about uh, a young man, 24 years old, no longer an athlete, just lost 120 pounds, reading all these books, listening to all the tapes, and then lost my dad. And so it was a really formidable time for me. And thank God that I had God in my life, but also I had mentors that 
were playing the game at a higher level and pulled me in the right direction and really said, Logan, this is a decision point for you in your life. And so I uh, thankfully made some good decisions and moved to Kansas City. I uh, bought my first house and that's how I got started in real estate. I did a live-in flip and I, I quickly realized uh, after I flipped that house and made more money than my salary for that year that I was doing the game the wrong way. Along the way, I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, which I'm sure many listeners here have probably uh, read that book and it had a really profound influence on the way that I thought and the way that I wanted to structure my life. And so I moved to Kansas City and you know started to, to really try to figure out where I was going to uh, play in the real estate space. It took me some time though. I wasn't full, fully sold on it. And so I worked a couple W-2 jobs and, and five years ago, I was fired from my last W-2 job. And that really was another decision point for me to say, okay, now is the time to really take control of my finances and take control of the direction of my life. And I have a very supportive wife. We were just recently married and she said, Logan, you know, I'm going to support you with what you want to do. And that's when I really stepped into to real estate full time and uh, started to grow a company. And that's where uh, I'm at now with FTW Investments. Well, for my listeners out there, that was, that was even more than I knew about Logan. So that's a heck of a story. And you, you had an interesting journey. And then I guess too, just to be totally clear, Rich Dad, Poor Dad does not sponsor this podcast, even though that book I think comes up on every single show, but it, it does move <laughs> people. And, and I'll ask you the question, every time it comes up, I ask everybody, like, what is it about that book? you know, that really kind of got you to move. Um, whereas there's a million real estate books and I'm, I'm sure you've read them just like I have. And like, that was the catalyst for me, right? Like that was the one that said, let's go do this. And, and we did it. Um, but what's, what's your story? I love it. It was clear. It was simple. It was a framework. You know, I like to think in mental models like Charlie Munger. I am a very quantifiable guy. I don't like theory. And, and, and so things that are complete at the theoretical level are fine, but I love ideas that are effective at the applied level. And so the quadrant of ESBI, you know, employee, self-employed, business owner and investor really started to ring true with me because the gentleman that helped me along my journey, not only uh, did they help me along my journey and help me make better decisions just in a life, you know, kind of realm, they were playing in that investor space. And so I had the ability to basically take that framework and then see it being lived out in individuals lives and see how beneficial it was so i would say that the framework of the quadrants was really important that paired with seeing actual individuals uh, living that out was the catalyst for me to really take action well i i appreciate you sharing because that's um, something about that book really has done something for so many people and I mean, I know there's a lot of people that get in, but just become burned out landlords and, and move on. And hence, maybe we can transition into the, the limited partner aspect of it. But before we get into that, I would love to know, you know, the, the transition from, you know, you bought your first house, you got into real estate, and then now we're talking about larger scale. So multifamily, yeah. and I know you're looking at other things. So I'd love to get kind of that story of how you made that, that swap. Yeah. Well, whenever I uh, was fired from my job, I actually started a sales consulting company because again, I wasn't necessarily sold on just doing real estate. I'd never been a 100% commission guy before. And so I uh, had a sales consulting company where I was doing everything from flying around and going to conferences and pitching products to making cold calls and setting up CRMs. And I, uh, at the same time, uh, just by happenstance through relationships, I had the opportunity to join a $50 million fund as their head of acquisitions. And so I was doing both of those at the same time, six months in, my wife really said, Logan, you really uh, have blown the doors off of this thing. That's fantastic. But all you do is complain about this sales consulting that you're doing. And all you do is talk about real estate and it fills you up. You need to focus. And so I dissolved that sales consulting company and finished up working with the fund. And we ended up doing 265 single family homes in a very short period of time. And we were the sixth group in the country to kind of go through a Corvest portfolio refinance, which means we recapitalized the whole project, returned capital to the investors and still cash flowed. And I just had to know how the sponsors had set that up. And they told me that it was a syndication and that they had raised funds from limited partners. And that was something I had never heard about. And so it put me on a new trajectory of understanding that side of the business. And so I moved my license to a commercial multifamily brokerage because I didn't have that much experience in that space. I started to represent buyers of 1031 exchanges and figure out how to find, vet, 
underwrite and acquire deals without using my own money, still working in the space as a broker. And I translated that into a lot of sales, which was fantastic. A lot of experience, which was important. That catapulted me into owning some properties by myself. And uh, what I learned by owning properties by myself was I was still not in the investor space. I was still in the business owner space. And I just needed to figure out how to create an actual business that would allow me to, to operate in my sweet spot, which is the greatest, the greater intersection of your strength and your passion. And so that put me on another uh, trajectory of going out and, and finding business partners that really, really could uh, supplement my skills. And so that took about 15 months. I found my business partners. They were working on something very similar. I said, I think I can bring a certain skill set that you guys are lacking and vice versa. And we were able to uh, solidify that relationship back in uh, early 19, or that's when we kind of really started buying properties together. Then COVID happened. So if you look at the Green Street property price index, there was a period of time from April of 2020 to October of 2020, where a lot of people were sitting on the sidelines and waiting and seeing what was going to happen. And thankfully, I had some mentors in the space that said, Logan, it's probably a pretty good time to go buy. And so we were able to aggregate funds from limited partners, put a team together and actually go buy over a thousand units in that period of time. And so where we're at now is uh, about 1300 units across four states on the multifamily side and entering into different asset classes. We own hospitality buildings. We have a couple office buildings. We're getting into shopping centers, the mobile home space as well. And so I think what I tried to do was overlay some mental models. And one of my favorite ones is from the Japanese called Ikigai, and it means the meaning for life. And that really helped me understand where my sweet spot was. I overlaid that with all of the relationships and experience that I had brokering all of the deals and said, what am I really good at? And so I had both of these mental models working together. And in that, I found an opportunity to say, okay, my strengths are finding properties, talking to people about it, seeing opportunity, building relationships, bringing them together, manufacturing opportunity out of thin air is what I'm really, really good at. And so, and communicating, I think is uh, one of my skills as well. And so I was able to say, okay, well, what else am I missing? And that was the finance, the accounting, the operations, the management. And so I went out and found partners that really have the ability to be in their sweet spots in those different functions of the business. And that is what really set us apart and we're, we're able to make some big strides in a short period of time. And we've been building that uh, operational team up and, and now we're up to about 22 employees uh, here in Kansas City. And so I think being really clear on what your skills are, understanding the transactions and the business that, that you're in, and then finding people that have complementary skill sets is what allowed us to scale so quickly. Yeah, I think there is, uh, I'm going to I'm gonna go back to something that was not necessarily central to a lot of the what you delivered there, but I thought it was really, it was pointed for me. You mentioned that your wife was able to help call out like, hey, look, this is where your your fire is. This is your passion yeah. and you're getting stuck. And it's, it's you know, let, let's go back in time for me, not too long ago. Like I, I was thinking like, I'm going to be a syndicator. Like this is so awesome and it's exciting. And it's really interesting that having started this journey with the Limited Partner podcast and really focused on like how to be the best limited partner, this is actually my passion, right? Like this is the area because it's not, it's not something that you can just do and it's super easy, right? Like you have to be thoughtful about what investments you get into and like what, what's out there for you. You know, it's not like just handing your money over to somebody and it's going to take a lot of work and, you know, I'm hundred conversations probably into this journey. And like, I feel like I'm just getting started and I get more excited, you know, connecting with people like you every day that, that are really good and are passionate about like your aspect of it. You know, like there's different yeah. sides of the fence. So I, I just think that was, it was really kind of telling. And it was funny because it just happened to me not too long ago where my wife was like calling me out on, Hey, this is, <laughs> this is what seems to be driving your passion. Like, why are you why are you pushing so hard over here? So thank you for sharing that because it, it really resonated with me. Um, well, if I can, I'll just yeah, add please. that um, males are typically a little more uh, bullheaded and like to hard charge forward. And women tend to be more strategic, uh, at least a lot of them that I know, and more thoughtful about things. And so at the end of the day, I think that what I learned was ego is the enemy. And humility is what will create the more op the most opportunity for someone. And so being humble enough to be coached 
through people that you respect, I think is a very key indicator of a successful person. And so being an athlete, I always needed to be coached to be the best version of myself. And being a husband and a father now and a business owner, you have to really check your ego at the door and be able to uh, take that coaching and make strides with it and be able to actually make decisions based on that. But uh, too many times I see that uh, one, people don't have folks that were are in their lives that are able to, you know, have these crucial conversations with them, or they are not willing to accept them and hear them out. And I think that is an extremely important thing because as uh, an operator myself of uh, real estate, and we have a lot of limited partners ourselves, I think they, yes, invest in real estate, but uh, first and foremost, they're investing in the people that are running that real estate. And um, you're, you're only as good as the principals that are are really running those deals. And I think that's extremely important to be humble. And I think that's a great segue to my next question is that you mentioned finding partners that brought skill sets that you didn't have. One, that's a very like business mature, like way of looking at things. And it's really kind of like part of my passion is that like, this doesn't need to be hard, right? And like when you're fighting against the grain and you're trying to do things that you're not good at, like it just, you get to burn out. But you also talk about mentors. I'm just wondering, is there a connection in there where you had somebody help guide you and be like, this, this is you, this is your box, like you really need to go focus or did you figure that out on your own? It's a little bit of both. You know, I read around 750 books and what I found through that process were some books that really stood out to me. One of them being Emotional Intelligence 2.0 and Strength Finders 2.0 where you can take tests and actually get better as a human. And IQ is typically pretty fixed, but your EQ, your emotional quotient is not. And so being able to be humble enough to say, okay, here's where my EQ is right now. And here's how I can get better is extremely important. Um, and that allowed me to be open. And uh, Wayne Dyer wrote, uh, you need to be open to everything and attached to nothing. And people that are so attached to their ideologies and or ways of doing things, because that's how it's always been done, are going to struggle. And the only constant in life is change. And so for me, I had the books that I read that I took full heartedly. I took that very seriously. I don't read as much as I did back then because I don't have as much time to do that. But what I learned, and I'm so grateful that I did go through that process, was there are certain books that you can revisit that really have a profound impact on you. And if you make changes based on what that says, and then overlay that with people that you respect and that are living the lives that you would want to live and playing the game at a higher level, and you spend time with them, then I think that is uh, another segue to actually seeing it back in uh, practicality. So again, another theme in my life is reading, understanding them at a theoretical level, but finding people that are living it out, spending time with them, and then adopting or modeling those same mentalities and behaviors that is uh, what has been able to allow me to continue to grow personally and professionally along the way. And so I'm always trying to spend time with guys that are and gals that are, are playing the game at a higher level than I am, because like you mentioned, you know, you're the sum of the, the five people that you spend the most time with. And so that's extremely important for me to be always be uh, pulled up you know, and not be the smartest person in the room, which I'm not uh, very often at all, but I am a learner. I am, I have, I have great input. I'm an achiever. I have a high level of competition and I know that my top talent is individualization. And so I'm a good communicator. I can understand other people's emotional intelligence and kind of the feeling of a room. And that really allows me to communicate and get my message across and, and help influence people in the right way. An additional segue here is that we've talked in the past about you kind of branching out. So most people start with one asset class, call it multifamily. You know, you're looking at the marketplace now and you're, you're looking at other assets and you mentioned several different types. You know, I think one, I'd like to get your, you know, your take on maybe the market and why you're doing that. Sure. And then, you know, two, this is a faux pas for asking a question, which is two questions is you know expanding your team right i think that's super important to make sure that you got the right players because you know what you did yesterday in this asset class is not the same as what you need to do tomorrow in a different one you know, first and foremost it was very important for me when when talking with my business partners that we are not a one-trick pony we are commercial real estate investors and we are opportunistic and we are value add investors so our thesis needed to be very strong and based on different market dynamics that are going on, we will have different opportunities. 
because we we know that the work from home situation is going to change. We know that people need a place to live over their you know their a, a roof over their head so they can live. We know that you know e-commerce is growing, but there are still essential businesses that folks need to go and actually buy products at. And so I think that for us making sure that, hey, just as when it's very difficult to purchase a property because there's a lot of competition in the marketplace, it makes a lot of sense to be able to pivot and understand different asset classes that provide an opportunity when other people are not maybe thinking about that. And so for for us, it, it really comes down to our past experience. You know, as a broker, I'd not just broker multifamily. It was retail, shopping centers, it was office buildings. My business partners have been involved in a ton of retail and office as well as self storage and development projects. And so thankfully we were able to bring, you know, a collectively 25 years of real estate experience, either in the multifamily space, retail, shopping centers, mobile home communities, and bring that into together and say, okay, what are the central themes that uh, reign true in all of these asset classes, right? Well, one, it's people. You have to have good people that understand how to work with people because we're in the real estate business. And I think that's extremely important. The second part is there will be different opportunities in different periods of time based on macroeconomic changes in, in a changing environment that's ever changing. And so as one asset class gets extremely competitive, you need to be able to think about other asset classes, similar to a Sam Zell model. You know, Sam Zell has done multifamily. He has done manufactured housing. He has done office. You know, I mean, he's been an opportunistic investor. He calls himself a professional opportunist. And the way that he thinks about his business is supply and demand, which is fantastic. But at the same time, he knows that from an operational standpoint, it's all people, it's all systems, processes, KPIs, experience. What do you have that you can bring to the table? What can we quantify on a regular basis? Early on in my career, I worked for Jimmy John's as a franchise consultant, and I learned very quickly what you can't measure, you can't manage. And so you need to be able to have really solid reporting on a regular basis, because if you don't have insight to what's going on, then how can you manage that, right? And so at the end of the day, we look at each asset class, we look at the supply and demand, we see where the thesis is, and then we say, okay, I think we understand that pretty well. What experience do we have? Okay, if we don't have any experience, then we need to go find somebody who does. So similar to myself finding my business partners, if we don't have operational experience in a certain asset class, we will go find a joint venture partner who does. And we will work with those folks on a regular basis and say, we believe you can bring this to the table. We can bring this to the table. Let's figure out if there's an opportunity here to work together. And that is a, a very collaborative approach that is difficult in a lot of different ways because people don't like working with people. And that goes back to ego is the enemy and being humble and being able to say, look, uh, maybe we have a smaller share of a bigger pie, but the projects are going to work better. We're going to have more opportunities and everybody's going to work in their sweet spot. So it comes back to that central theme that I was I was mentioning. And so I think that's how we think about investing in real estate just in general in regards to building a team. This is all about communication. And so there's three levels of delegation. You have directive, objective, and leadership. And our goal as business owners is to get as many people working under that leadership aspect that we possibly can. But when you hire somebody brand new, you know, that doesn't have a ton of experience, you have to be very directive with them. Then you move to objective and let them start making some decisions themselves. And then over a period of time, 12, 24 months, maybe they can get to be a leader in their own right when they feel comfortable and having regular check-ins with those employees, understanding what their skill sets are. We're extremely, you know, focused on the Colby assessment and principles you, the one from uh, Ray Dalio, and uh, understanding that uh, there's different strengths here. And what I don't like to do, maybe you do, and that's fantastic. So it's all about getting the right people on the right seats and moving the bus in the right direction. But that takes a lot of people time. That takes a lot of communication. That takes a lot of understanding that there's three levels of delegation. And if you're trying to lead somebody that needs directive, they're going to be unsuccessful. And so this just comes back to actual business ownership and key elements of that, which is clarity on a vision. It's communication. It's setting goals. It's understanding what uh, actions and activities need to, to happen to actually move in the right direction on those goals and being able to check in on a regular basis. And so we utilize um, the EOS system, the entrepreneur's uh, operating system through Gina Wickman's book, Traction, to help run our company. And I think that has created a lot of clarity for a lot of our employees. And also, 
Um, it, it creates a lot of communication. So thinking about standard operating procedures from investor relations to asset management, to del- due diligence, to placing debt, to selling and disposition. You know, there's so many different pieces of this business that you have to have actual standing operating pr- procedures around. Just because I know how to do it here doesn't mean that Lee or Danny or Matt or Allison or Crystal knows exactly what to do. And so we have to get that out of the principal's heads. We have to get it into systems and processes that our employees can then tap into and say, look, I think this actually needs to be refined this way and then be humble enough to change and pivot and make, you know, those coordinated efforts to become better across those every single day. And I think that is, you know, the entrepreneur's dilemma sometimes when you think about the de- delegation piece, everybody wants to hold on to what they're doing and and they have a hard time kind of passing it off. But if you do it the right way, yes, it takes 150% more time up front, but it gives you 250% more time on the back end if you can get people trained up and they're in working in their sweet spot. So I think that's a, a big focus for us uh, on a regular basis. This is some great points. I think um, traction is probably starting to come in as a number two book that I'm hearing about a lot. So I, I thought that was that was a good point as well. But yeah, building building the right team, finding the expertise, having some humbleness. I couldn't agree more. But let's I'm going to I'm going to switch gears on you a little bit here and sure. talk about returns. Um, this is a question that's coming up a little bit more now as, as, as people are kind of getting into the show and understanding, okay, you know, there's a limited partnership and like, it sounds like it's, it's an opportunity to get some outsized returns backed by real estate. So, you know, I personally think that real estate and real estate, private equity, and kind of what we're talking about here is the fastest way to grow your wealth safe. But let's talk about returns. What, what type of returns, and I'm not like holding you to anything, but you know, should people be looking at or like what's a realistic kind of return and return horizon? Well, I think that different asset classes obviously are going to give you different opportunities. The way that we think about this is, okay, in in regards to risk and return, there is a curve, right? And as you move up that curve, you potentially have more reward, but you are taking more risk. And so the less risky asset class are core assets. These are brand new buildings that have 25 to 30 year leases on them or it's a brand new class A multifamily building that you're buying at stabilized stabilization. Then you have core plus, maybe this is five, 10, 15 years old, has a little bit of opportunity to renew some leases, add some cosmetic upgrades, but not a ton. And then you go into value add, and that's typically where we have spent most of our time is the value add. So this is where we can actually physically force appreciation through a cosmetic upgrade or an operational efficiency. On the last uh, point of the, of the spectrum, you have opportunistic plays. So this would be historic readaptive use projects. This would be development opportunities. So that is kind of the risk and reward spectrum, right? Now, you can also implement these in your business plan. So that that's the at stabilization. There's also the opportunity to do opportunistic deals that will be a core product, right? So you think about this from a stabilized yield on cost standpoint. We were buying 1970s, Uh, Class C apartments between $40,000 and $50,000 a door here in Kansas City 15 months ago. Those same deals are now $85,000 to $90,000 per door. So the stabilized yield on cost, which is just simply the stabilized NOI or net operating income divided by the total purchase price um, and the renovation costs that you have, your hard costs in the project, are, are, are starting to be the same. So when you think about new class A development being at a six and a quarter stabilized yield on cost, and you have a 1970s product that has a lot of capex and probably not the best area with the same stabilized yield on cost, it starts to make sense to think about different asset classes and different business plan strategies. And that's where uh, our thesis has started to shift uh, just a little bit in regards to that, because those stabilized yield on costs 15 months ago for our value add deals are above eight and a quarter, right? And so when you think about that, then you're taking more risk, but you're getting potentially less reward and you're not in the right asset class. And so I think investors really have to understand the difference between core, core plus, value add, opportunistic, not just from a stabilized standpoint, but the actual business plan implementation of that. And then think about the returns that they're willing to get. So, you know, I just met with uh, an owner of a business here. He owns a very large bank here in Kansas City. I said, give me some advice, man. You know, uh, we were at lunch yesterday. You know, he's 65 years old. I said, give me some advice. He said, man, this is the time to be conservative and to make sure that you do not get your uh, self overextended. And so I think that uh, when I look at, uh, you know, these projects that are being done with negative cash flows for a long time, they're based on interest only, uh, you know, debt and not fully amortizing debt. Uh, I can't tell the future. You know, I think if anybody could, uh, Ray Dalio is probably one of the best uh, at, at telling the future uh, by studying the, the past. 
But at the end of the day, I think it's time to, to really refocus on cash flow, to focus on long-term fixed rate debt, and to make conservative assumptions in regards to rents, just because rents have gone up 14, 15% average in the United States the last year doesn't mean that's going to continue. We're in a high inflationary period. We have a lot of different things going on in regards to the pandemic, a war, uh, the big debt and debt monetization that you need to be thinking through as well. So it's time to make very conservative bets. And that's uh, unfortunately for limited partners in some scenarios means lower returns, but it also, if it done right, means lower risk. And so I think what we're trying to do right now is find cash flowing assets that we can put fixed rate debt on, have conservative uh, loan to costs or loan to values on on the, uh, the actual debt that we're putting on these deals. And we feel very good about the location of the of the projects, you know, and, and one thing that you always hear about in real estate is location, location, location. Well, I can tell you firsthand uh, that is true, and not only location, but the actual product type that you have too as well. So uh, I'm definitely focusing more on Class B uh, apartment complexes, uh, cash flowing shopping centers that are well located, mobile home communities which historically have been recession resistant and uh, still trying to find the needle in the haystack multifamily deals, but you have to have a margin of safety. Very simply put, on a margin of safety, if your rent is $750, typically we're gonna be able to pay you, you know, between 65 dollars and $75,000 per unit, right? But what's happened is those units are now ninety-five dollars to $115,000, so you're really paying for the value add on the front end, and that doesn't create a margin of safety. Everything has to go right on the operations, on the deal, and I can tell you that not everything always goes right and goes to plan, and so making sure you have a margin of safety and you can protect your investor's capital is first and foremost. Well, for, for those of you that are out there listening, Logan just dropped a lot of knowledge on us, and I would probably recommend going back and we'll even put it in the show notes and listening to that section a couple of times because there's a lot of really key nuggets and, and Logan, thank you. Thank you for sharing all that. But as we, as we kind of come to the end here, I always like to end my podcast with a bit of gratitude to give somebody yeah. thanks because you know, look, none of us are where we are because we did it all by ourselves and somebody looked favorably upon you and you probably didn't deserve it at some point in time. And I'd, I'd love to give you a forum here to, to give somebody or a couple of somebody's a little shout out to say thank you. Well, first and foremost, I'm going to shout out to, I'm a big Christian Catholic guy to Jesus Christ who really pulled me out of the lowest period of my time and gave me kind of the plan, right? And uh, alongside that, I would say uh, my wife, you know, she had a uh, standard of living, a standard of expectations that I did not have for myself. And uh, it was not just uh, professionally. I had a very high standard for myself professionally, but it was lifestyle. It was uh, everything outside of business per se. And she holds me to a, a very high standard in regards to uh, the way that I conduct myself, but also in, in the way that I am being trying to be humble on a regular basis. You know, I think the attorneys always say past performance do not provide an indicator of, of future performance. And I would say in this business, every single day, you got to check your ego at the door. And you got to make sure you got to make sure that you are willing to roll your sleeves up and be better than you were yesterday. Because just because you hit a home run a one year doesn't mean it's going to happen again this year. And so just being really cognizant of that. And she holds me extremely uh, accountable in regards to making sure I stay humble on a regular basis. So I would say that that's what I'm extremely grateful for. I'm also extremely grateful for for living in the United States, the best country in the world, uh, for my freedoms um, and for my health and for my beautiful children as well. Well, Logan, that was awesome. And this was an incredible conversation. There's a lot packed in, in just a short 30 minutes. So thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you for having me, Jake. And thanks for all the thoughtful questions. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Limited Partner Podcast. Please subscribe and leave a review. If there's any reason you wouldn't leave us a five-star review, please email me at jw at jakewiley.com. Your feedback is always appreciated. The show is just the tip of the iceberg in terms of the limited partner community. It's a community where limited partners can come together to learn about what best in class looks like and opportunities, and most importantly, a place to connect. There is nothing out there like this. So head over to thelimitedpartner.com and sign up. We'll see you next time.